Darwin's Doubt, Part 12. We've been going through Darwin's Doubt, written by Steve Meyer, author of Signature in the Cell. Uh, he was an oil industry geophysicist uh, before he got interested in the question of the origin of life. And with that interest, he went and got a PhD from Cambridge in the philosophy of science, which uh, we're going to be talking about. This is his PhD field. He's the director for the Center for Science and Culture of the Discovery Institute in Seattle. The book is actually a massive expansion of the article that got him into trouble um, and got Richard Sternberg into trouble for editing it and publishing it. There's the book. In the prologue, it says the book is divided into three main parts, and it is. Part one, the mystery of the missing fossils. Part two, how to build an animal. And part three, after Darwin, what? Now, we're gonna I'm gonna give you a quick synopsis of where the book has been so far. Um, the presentation will be in subscripts and the book chapter will be in superscripts. The sudden appearance of multiple life forms in the Cambrian was a major unsolved problem for Darwin. And the problem has only grown worse with the discovery of the Burgess Shale and the Changjiang fossils. The excuse that precursors were soft-bodied and therefore not preserved has been refuted by the evidence. Claims that intermediates are really there are lacking evidence and not believed by most authorities. Genetics seems to demand intermediates if common descent is assumed. Uh, some people use the tree of life to try to trump all this stuff, but the tree of life has its own problems and cannot be used as a counterbalance to the problem of the Cambrian explosion. And punctuated equilibrium does not explain the Cambrian explosion either. All of those statements have a huge amount of research and uh, references behind them. The reason why the Cambrian explosion is a challenge for Darwinism is that Darwinism has to explain the origin of massive amounts of information. Not just Shannon information, but functional information. Information that will actually tell, for example, proteins exactly, or at least within the limits of error, as to how much, or, or what sequence has to be there bef if so as to create an enzyme that will do a particular job. There has always been doubt that Darwinism was up to the job, but the work of Yaki, Sauer, and now Axe have made that job much more daunting. Steve Meyer then wrote a paper that called attention to this work, only to see the paper put in a figurative index and Richard Sternberg to be effectively excommunicated. The only paper to attempt an answer to Meyer's article was an internet article, and Meyer takes that particular ar article apart showing that the article's main peer-reviewed support doesn't say what the article says it says. Uh, new developments in population genetics have made more clear the magnitude of the barriers to getting even small changes in DNA that are advantageous, especially in multicellular animals. Developmental gene regulatory networks, which can't change significantly without damaging or killing the creature, but must change to give rise to a new body plan, and epigenetic information also challenge Darwinism. That's part two, how to build an animal, and then part three, several modifications of or alternatives to Darwinian theory have been proposed, uh, which of course implies that Darwinian theory is somewhat weak itself. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't have to propose a new theory to replace it. Uh, Evo Devo, Neutral Evolution, Neo-Lamarckianism, and Natural Genetic Engineering. Each of these has weaknesses, and perhaps the prof most profound common weakness to all of them is the inability to explain the origin of specified complexity or information. Intelligent design explains information well, and using abductive reasoning, standard in historical science, it is the best current explanation for the facts of the Cambrian explosion. 
It accounts for generating new forms rapidly, generating a top-down pattern of appearance, constructing complex integrated circuits, and the reuse of the same part in different settings. And we are now uh, getting towards the end of part three after Darwin what? And intelligent design has been presented and now one of the major objections to intelligent design is being given. The rules of science. The argument of the previous chapter raises an obvious question. If intelligent design provides such a clear and satisfying resolution to the mystery of the Cambrian explosion, why have so many brilliant scientists missed it? While reflecting on this question, I came across a short story by G.K. Chesterton called The Invisible Man, which may cast some light on it. In The Invisible Man, Chesterton tells the story of someone who is murdered in an apartment with only one entrance an entrance watched by four honest men. These men insist that during their watch, no one entered or left the building. A brilliant French detective investigates the case along with his friend, a dusty little Catholic priest. They query the guards, each of whom insists that no one entered or exited the building. But then the unimpressive looking priest, Father Brown, all but forgotten in the background, pipes up to ask, has nobody been up and down stairs then? since the snow began to fall? Certainly not, they assure him. Then I wonder what that is, Father Brown asks, gazing at the white snow on the outside entrance stairs. Everyone turns to find a stringy pattern of gray footprints there. God, one of them cries, an invisible man. After asking a few more questions, Father Brown quickly unravels the mystery. When those four quite honest men said that no man had gone into the mansions, they did not really mean that no man had gone into them, Father Brown explains to his detective friend. They meant that no man whom they could suspect of being your man. A man did go into the house and did come out of it, but they never noticed him. An invisible man? A mentally invisible man, the priest explains. What does a mentally invisible man look like? He is dressed rather handsomely in red, blue, and gold, the priest explains. And in this striking and even showy costume, he entered the Himalaya mansions, the name of the apartment complex, under eight human eyes. He killed the murder victim in cold blood and came down into the street again carrying the dead body. You have not noticed such a man as this. At that moment, he reaches out and puts his hand on an ordinary passing postman, one who had almost slipped by them unnoticed. No one, nobody ever noticed postmen somehow, Father Brown nurse, muses, yet they have passions like other men and even carry large bags where a small corpse, corpse can be stowed away quite easily. The passing postman, of course, is the murderer. He walked up and down the stairs under four men's noses, but because of their mental blinders, telling them whom to consider and whom to ignore, they overlooked the postman entirely. The theme is a favorite of detective story authors. The obvious possibility missed by the experts because their assumptions prevent them cons from considering what might otherwise seem to be an obvious possibility. Could something like that be at work in the investigation of the Cambrian explosion? Could evolutionary biologists and paleontologists be wearing a set of mental blinders that keeps them from considering a possible explanation of the Cambrian mystery? Odd as it may seem, that is exactly what has been going on in the investigation of the Cambrian explosion. In this case, however, those wearing the mental blinders have elevated an unwillingness to consider certain explanations to a principle of scientific method. That principle is called methodological naturalism or methodological materialism. Methodological naturalism asserts that to qualify as scientific, a theory must explain phenomena and every events in nature, even events such as the origin of the universe and life, or phenomena such as human consciousness, by reference to strictly material causes. According to this principle, Scientists may not invoke the activity of a mind or, as one philosopher of science put it, any creative intelligence. 
Do you see how adherence to this principle has prevented scientists from considering a possibly true, even causally adequate, explanation for the Cambrian explosion? Let's revisit the case reported in Chapter 11 of Richard Sternberg. I'm going to skip the picture. The evolutionary biologist at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. After Sternberg published my article arguing for intelligent design as the best explanation of the Cambrian information explosion in the technical journal Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington, you may remember that's the one that we had reference to at the very beginning, he suffered professional retribution at the, at the hands of Smithsonian administrators. The Biological Society of Washington, the governing body that oversees the publication of the journal that Sternberg then edited, also issued a public statement repudiating his decision. Now, so far, this is just, well, you know, they're doing, uh, he did something wrong. But this is where it gets interesting. Its statement, however, did not cite any factual errors in the article or seek to rebut it. Further, the president of the society, Smithsonian zoologist Roy McDiarmid, Mid, McDiarmid, wrote Sternberg privately and told him that he, McDiarmid, had reviewed the file containing the peer-reviewed reports and had found everything to be in order. What then had Sternberg done to deserve public rebuke? Sternberg published a paper that violated a presumed rule of science, methodological naturalism. Without saying it in so many words, the Biological Society made crystal clear that this was the crucial issue. When it distanced itself from Sternberg and the review essay, it did not invite a scientific re refutation of the article, or give one, for that matter, as if the problem had been a misrepresentation or misinterpretation of the evidence. Instead, it attempted to settle the issue by releasing a policy statement. As a writer in the Wall Street Journal reported at the time, the Biological Society of Washington released a vaguely ecclesiastical statement regretting its association with the article. It did not address its arguments, but denied its orthodoxy. Citing a resolution of the American Association for the Advancement of Science that defined ID, that's the interior theory of intelligent design, as by its very nature, unscientific. The Biological Society of Washington deemed the paper inappropriate for the pages of the proceedings. The Society attempted to justify this claim, first on thin procedural grounds, claiming that a paper about the origin of animal body plants represented a departure from its more typical concern with issues of animal classification. Wrong journal. But second, and more tellingly, it cited the policy statement of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, calling upon its members to understand the nature of science and to recognize the inappropriateness of intelligent design theory as subject matter for science education. Science education? Setting aside the obvious point that my paper was, not writ was written not as a curricular manifesto, but as an evidence-based scientific argument, the AAAS statement affirmed an implicitly and strictly materialistic understanding of the nature of science. It did so to disqualify intelligent design from consideration, not only in science education, but in science itself. The Sternberg case, like numerous others in which the academic freedom of scientists advocating intelligent design has been abridged, and you'll notice there's a footnote giving uh, a lot of details and references for more, goes a long way to answering the question of why so many otherwise brilliant and knowledgeable scientists have overlooked such a seemingly obvious possible answer to the Cambrian conundrum. As in Chesterton's story about the invisible postman, they have accepted a self-imposed limitation on the hypothesis they are willing to consider. These scientists think they are doing their duty to science. Yet if researchers refuse as a matter of principle to consider the design hypothesis, they will obviously miss any evidence that happens to support it. 
And the cultural pressure within biology to avoid considering the intelligent design hypothesis has long been non-trivial. Francis Crick, for example, famously admonished biologists to, quote, constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. That's very interesting. Francis Crick in later life decided that this came from outer space somewhere, that we were seeded, which interestingly enough is, at least in theory, an intelligent design principle. Well, that's, uh, if you ask Richard Dawkins, they must have evolved. In other words, it's not really illegal to uh, invoke intelligent design. It's just illegal to invoke supernatural intelligent design. Intelligent design is perfectly scientific in that sense. What's not scientific in that sense is to have God intervene in nature. That's the bottom line. In 1997, in an article in the New York Review of Books, Harvard geneticist Richard Lewontin uh, made explicit a similar commitment to a strictly materialist, uh, materialistic explanation, whatever the evidence might seem to indicate. As he explained in a now often quoted passage, and some of you I'm sure have heard this any number of times, we take the side of science in spite of, and of interest, um, although I've left it the way it was, in spite is italicized in the original, and the rest of this is not. He's italicizing this to show it's a quotation. Um, in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of, again, italicized of its fav failure to produce, to fulfill many of its extravagant, extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of, again, italicized, the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world. But on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence, that's italicized, but just simply to show it's Latin, um, to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. The commitment to methodological naturalism that Lewontin describes, as well as the behavior of scientists in cases such as Sternberg's, leaves no doubt that many in science simply will not consider the design hypothesis as an explanation for the Cambrian explosion or any other event in the history of life, whatever the evidence. To do so would be to violate the rules of science as they understand them. But is it science? But are these scientists right? Perhaps science must limit itself to purely naturalistic or materialistic explanations. If so, are there perhaps good reasons for excluding the design hypothesis from consideration as a scientific hypothesis? Is methodological naturalism the correct policy for science? The scientists normally, uh, pardon me, routinely assert methodological naturalism as a scientific norm. That principle and its exclusion of the design hypothesis have proven difficult to justify. And note that some of these same people actually appeal to intelligent design. To claim that a specific theory does not qualify as scientific requires a definition of science or a, sort, a set of definitional criteria by which to make that kind of judgment. You gotta know what science is before you can say something is not science. Some philosophers and scientists have asserted that for a scientific theory to, be, to qualify as scientific, 
it must meet various criteria of testability, falsifiability, observ observability, repeatability, and the like. Philosophers of science call these demarcation criteria because some scientists purport to use them to define or demarcate science and to distinguish it from pseudoscience or from other forms of inquiry such as history, religion, or metaphysics. The general problem of demarcation. For example, and uh, again, I'm doing Reader's Digest version, um, just some of the things that people have used to distinguish science from non-science. Uh, perhaps uh, science distinguishes and classifies natural entities. Maybe it formulates overarching laws, performs laboratory experiments, attempts to reconstruct or explain events in the past, to generate mathematical descriptions, to look for mechanisms, to make predictions, to test competing theories by comparing their explanatory power. To use both of those uh, two preceding methods, uh, some conjectures, particularly in theoret theoretical physics, may not be testable at all. An episode in the history of science illustrates the problem. During the 17th century, and remember this is what he did his PhD on, by the way, at Cambridge where Newton once taught. A group of scientists called mechanical philosophers insisted, based largely on advances in early chemistry, that scientific theories must provide mechanistic explanations. Such explanations had to involve one material entity pushing or pulling another. Yet in physics, Isaac Newton formulated an important theory that provided no mechanistic explanation. His theory of universal gravitation described mathematically, but did not explain in a mechanistic way the gravitational attraction between planetary bodies. Bodies separated from each other by miles of empty space, sometimes thousands, maybe millions of miles, with no means of mechanical interaction with each other whatsoever. Despite provocation from the German mathematician Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, or Leibniz uh, who defended the me mechanistic ideal and uh, who also argued with uh, Newton over who invented calculus, apparently they both did, uh, Newton expressly refused to give any explanation, mechanistic or otherwise, for the mysterious action at a distance that his theory described. In Latin, he's, uh, he's famously quoted as saying, hypothesis non fingo. And that is the problem. If scientists and philosophers of science do not have an agreed upon definition of science, how can they settle questions about which theories do and do not qualify as scientific? If scientists lack such a definition, it's difficult to argue that any particular theory is unscientific by definition. For this reason, philosophers of science, the scholars who study the nature and definition of science, now almost universally reject the use of demarcation arguments to decide the validity of theories or settle a competition between them. That is, the demarcation problem has been basically declared insoluble. Uh, it's of interest, if you want to go further on the example of Newton, this is of course not in the book, but uh, one of the contribu uh, contributions of Einstein was his general theory of relativity, which allowed um, for um, objects to set up a field around them, which explained gravity as a... Uh, sort of an emanation from the objects themselves. Uh, very similar to the electromagnetic field, which had been discovered by um, Faraday and Maxwell, uh, that had uh, a, f a field that went out from an a electrically charged object, uh, possibly moving, that would uh, uh, give you uh, action at a distance very similar to the gravitational action at a distance. And so uh, if you allow fields as something that's mechanical, then uh, Einstein made gravity mechanical. 
But at the same time, he was one of the major contributors to quantum theory, which now does not have its own known mechanism, nor any that anybody is, uh, uh, can I say, that any that, uh, that uh, is, appears to anybody to be reasonable at this time. In other words, quantum mechanics is, not, is mechanical, or pardon me, is mathematical, but not mechanical, in the same way, in, in one sense, that gravitational fields are mechanical, but not mathematical, or vice versa. So we still have that problem in science today in what's kind of our core theory. Thus, philosophers of science generally think it much more important to assess whether a theory is true or whether the evidence supports it than whether it should or should not be classified as science. The question of whether a theory is scientific is really a red herring. Again, this is a philosopher of science pointing out what most philosophers of science will tell you. The question of whether a theory Let's see, what we really want to know is whether a theory is true or false, supported by the evidence or not, worthy of our belief or not, and I might add, can make predictions or not. And we cannot decide those questions by applying a set of abstract criteria that purport to tell in advance what all good scientific theories must look like. Define and dismiss demarcation arguments against intelligent design. The rejection of demarcation elements among philosophers of science has not stopped critics of intelligent design from attempting to settle debates about biological orig origins by the expedient of formulating such arguments against intelligent design. Some use these arguments to justify methodological naturalism, which has the same effect. And basically what he's saying is the philosophers of science are cutting the ground out from under these people, but they act like they don't even recognize that. Advocates of methodological naturalism have argued that the theory of intelligent design is inherently unscientific for some or all of the following reasons. It is not testable. It is not falsifiable. It does not make predictions. It does not describe repeated phenomena. It does not explain by reference to natural law. It does not cite a mechanism, it does not make tentative claims, and it has no problem-solving capability. Some of those are obviously related to each other. They've also claimed that it is not science because it refers to an unobservable entity. These critics also assume, imply, or assert that materialistic evolutionary theories do meet such criteria of proper scientific method. Otherwise, you'd have to put them both outside of science, which, of course, would have implications for teaching evolution in science classes. Readers may wish to consult Signature in the Cell for a more detailed response to these specific arguments. Obviously, it's come up before, and he's answered it before, but he's going to say a little more. There I show that many of these claims are simply false. That is, contrary to claims of its critics, intelligent design is testable. It does make predictions. It does formulate its claims tentatively. And it does have scientific problem-solving capability. Which, by the way, is one reason why you want to be very careful about using the word prove. Because if you're talking about logical proof, as opposed to perhaps an overwhelming evidence kind of proof. Um, science can't do that, and neither can intelligent design. But I show that when the claims of those making demarcation arguments are true, when intelligent design doesn't meet a specific criterion, the fact, that fact does not provide a good reason for excluding intelligent design from consideration as a scientific theory. Why? Because the materialistic evolutionary theories that intelligent design challenges, theories widely regarded by convention as scientific, fail to meet the very same demarcation standard. 
For example, some critics of intelligent design have argued that it fails to qualify as a scientific theory because it makes reference to an unseen and unobservable entity, namely a designing mind in the remote past. Yet many accepted theories, theories assumed to be scientific, postulate unobservable events and entities. Physicists postulate forces, fields, and quarks. Biochemists infer submicroscopic structures. Psychologists discuss their patients' mental states. I might add, geologists discuss meteorites that hit the Earth 65 million years ago. They never saw them. Evolutionary biologists themselves Inver, uh, infer unobserved past mutations and invoke the existence of extinct organisms and transitional forms for which no fossils remain. Such things, like the actions of an intelligent designer, are inferred from observable evidence in the present because of the explanatory off uh, power they may offer. Reasons to regard des intelligent design as a scientific theory. Demarcation arguments fail to justify excluding intelligent design from science. But it turns out that there are some good, if convention dependent, reasons to regard intelligent design as a scientific theory. Notice that he's being careful to say it isn't a scientific theory, it is if you assume certain conventions. For example, many scientists and philosophers of science regard testability as an important feature of scientific inquiry. And intelligent design is testable in three specific and interrelated ways. First, like other scientific theories concerned with explaining events in the remote past, intelligent design is testable by comparing its explanatory power with that of competing theories. Second, intelligent design, like other historical scientific theories, is tested against our knowledge of the cause and effect structure of the world. As we have discussed, historical scientific theories provide adequate explanations when they cite causes that are known to produce the effects in question, or in the phrase of um, Lyell, causes now in operation. Because of this, the plausibility of historical scientific theories, including intelligent design, can be tested by reference to independent knowledge of cause and effect relationships. Third, although historical scientific theories typically cannot be tested under controlled laboratory conditions, they do sometimes generate predictions that enable scientists to compare their merit to the, that of other theories. Intelligent design has generated a number of specific empirical predictions that distinguish it from competing evolutionary theories and that serve to confirm the design hypothesis over its competitors. In Signature in the Cell, I described 10 such predictions that the theory of intelligent design has generated. And of course, he references those. There is another compelling, if convention-dependent, reason to regard intelligent design as a scientific theory. The infer inference to intelligent design is based upon the same method of historical scientific reasoning and the same uniformitarian principles that Charles Darwin used in the origin of, on the origin of species. The similarity in logical structure runs quite deep. He talks about abductive inferences. He talks about the historical questions. And, and there are metaphysical implications. Insofar as we regard Darwin's theory as a scientific theory, it seems appropriate to de designate the theory of intelligent design as a scientific theory as well. That is to say, if Darwin can use abductive inferences, if Darwin can talk about historical questions, and if Darwin can have a theory with metaphysical implications, then why not have intelligent design as a theory? Because among other things, it has the same general structure and implications. Indeed, neo-Darwinism and the theory of intelligent design are not two different kinds of inquiry, as some critics have asserted. There are two different answers formula formulated using a similar logic and method of reasoning to the same question. What caused biological forms and the appearance of design to arise in the history of life? It stands to reason that if we regard one theory, neo-Darwinism or intelligent design, as scientific, we should regard the other as the same. For readers who would like to consider more detailed responses to arguments about whether intelligent design qualifies as science, 
I recommend chapters 18 and 19 in Signature in the Cell. In Signature, I respond in detail to other philosophical objections to the case for intelligent design. That is, that intelligent design is religion, that it uses flawed and logical reasoning, that it uses arguments from ignorance, sometimes called the God of the Gaps objection, and that it is a science stopper. And, of course, the question of who designed the designer, and many others. A new objection to the scientific status of intelligent design. Since the publication of Sin Signature in the Cell, Robert Asher, a University of Cambridge paleontologist from Myers Old Stamping Grounds, uh, has offered another reason. In, in his book, Evolution and Belief, he challenges my claim, Meyer's claim, of course, to have used the uniformitarian method of Lyell and Darwin to develop the case for intelligent design. Since his objection is new, published only in 2012 by Cambridge University Press, it deserves discussion. So he's going to discuss it. Asher characterizes Meyer's thinking as follows. The processes we know and observe today are relevant to explaining the pro phenomena of the past, and we know that particularly complicated things that we see today have an intelligence behind them. He notes that I argue certain complex technologies, such as computer software, have only one source, human ingenuity. It follows, according to Asher's paraphrase of my argument, that a similarly complex device we observe in the geologic past must also have arisen as a result of something like human ingenuity, that is, intelligence. Asher doesn't seem to understand the importance of specified information as opposed to, quote, complicated things. It's not just a, a, a list of ones and zeros that um, don't have any obvious pattern. It's that those ones and zeros actually do something in the computer uh, that require them to be very carefully specified in only one or perhaps a few different ways. That aside, he does claim to recognize the role of uniformitarian principles of reasoning in my argument for intelligent design. In spite of this, Asher elsewhere disputes that I employ the uniformitarian method of reasoning. Why? According to Asher, the inference to intelligent design is actually anti-uniformitarian because it doesn't provide a mechanism, as he puts it, by attempting to replace a causal mechanism, natural selection, with an attribution of agency, that is design. ID advocates such as Meyer are decidedly anti-uniformitarian. What process of today could possibly lead to his understanding of the past? The answer to Asher's question is intelligence, conscious activity, the deliberate choice of a rational agent. Indeed, we have abundant experience in the present, in the present of intelligent agents generating specified information. In other words, our experience of the cause and effect structure of the world, specifically the cause known to produce large amounts of specified information in the present, it is precisely my reliance on such experience that makes possible an understanding of the type of causes at work in the history of life. It also makes my argument decidedly uniformitarian, not anti-uniformitarian in character. Asher confuses the uniformitarian imperative in historical scientific explanations with a demand for citing a material cause or mechanism. The theory of intelligent design does cite a cause, and indeed one known to produce the effects in question, but it does not necessarily cite a mechanistic or materialistic cause. Proponents of intelligent design may conceive of intelligence as a strictly materialistic process, something reducible to the neurochemistry of a brain, but they may also conceive of it as part of a mental reality that is ir irreducible to brain chemistry or to any other physical process. Asher assumes that intelligent design denies a materialistic or physicalist account of the mind, as Meyer does personally, in fact, and rejects it as unscientific on that basis. But he offers no non-circular reason for making that judgment. He cannot say that the principle of methodological naturalism requires that all genuinely scientific theories invoke only mechanistic causes, because the principle of methodological naturalism itself needs justification. 
Nevertheless, the concern that he raises about the theory of intelligent design not citing a mechanism still troubles people. In fact, I get frequently get questions about this issue. People will ask something like this. I can see your point about digital code providing evidence for intelligent design, but how exactly did the designing intelligence generate that information or arrange matter to form cells or animals? Or how did the intelligent designer that you infer impress its ideas on matter to form animals? As Asher puts it, how could a biological phenomenon, even if designed, be simply willed into existence without an actual mechanism? To help clear things up, several points need to be considered. First, the theory of intelligent design does not provide a mechanistic account for the origin of biological information or form, nor does it attempt to. Instead, it alters a ca an alternative causal explanation involving a mental rather than a necessarily or exclusively material cause for the origin of that reality. It attributes the origin of information and living origins to thought, to the rational activity of a mind, not a strictly material process or mechanism. Often those who want uh, to know about the mechanism of intelligent design are not necessarily challenging the idea that information ultimately originates in thought. They want to know how or by what material means the intelligent agent responsible for the information in living systems transmitted that information to a material entity such as a strand of DNA. To use a term from philosophy, they want to know about the efficient cause at work. The answer is we simply don't know. We don't have enough evidence or information about what happened in the Cambrian explosion or other events in the history of life to answer questions about what exactly happened. Even though we can establish from the clues left behind that an intelligent designer played a causal role in the origin of living forms. Um, he then has a discussion about Easter Island. Um, uh, East, he actually uses the term Easter Island in the figure, but he doesn't, uh, uh, he doesn't use it in the text. That's why it's in brackets. These figures left no doubt as to their ultimate origin in thought, you know, the statues of Easter Island. And nevertheless, archaeologists still don't know the exact means by which they were carved or erected. The ancient head carvers might have used metallic hammers, rock chisels, or lasers for that matter. Though archaeologists lack the evidence to decide between various hypotheses about how the figures were constructed, they can still definitely infer that intelligent agents made them. And if you think about it, if you're, you're looking at uh, writing on a screen, you can infer that an intelligent agent did it, but you don't know whether I copied and pasted out of something, whether I had an optical character recognition thing, uh, what, uh, or whether I hand typed it out, or whether I dictated it to somebody uh, in the room or over the phone. It might have been typed out by somebody in India. What you do know is that uh, I somehow made it happen and that um, I did it according to uh, original text by Steve Meyer. That is, those of you who have Steve Meyer's book and are reading along. At present, no one has any idea how our thoughts, the decisions and choices that occur in our conscious minds, affect our material brains, nerves, and muscles. Well, once we get to the nerves and muscles, we do know. But uh, how it affects our material brains, we don't. Uh, going on to instantiate our will in the material world of objects. However, we know that this is exactly what our thoughts do. We have no mechanistic explanation for the mystery of consciousness, nor what is called the mind-body problem. The enigma of how thought affects the material state of our brains, bodies, and the world that we have, uh, affect with them. Yet there is no doubt that we can, as the result of evidence, events in our conscious mind, called decisions or choices, will into existence information-rich arrangements of matter or otherwise affect material states in the world. And of course, we can do that by several different ways, as I've just pointed out and as he pointed out before. 
why it matters for science. But if proponents of intelligent design admit that they do not, or perhaps even cannot, answer the question of how the mind responsible for the design of animal life impressed its ideas on matter, why does it matter that we recognize the evidence for intelligent design at all? If intelligent design just replaces one mystery with another, why not limit ourselves to materialistic explanations after all, as methodological naturalism requires, and be content with accepting the mystery we already have? Wouldn't that be simpler and more intellectually economical? If we were to ask what caused the Rosetta Stone to arise, and then insist that despite all evidence to the contrary, that a purely, materialistic, purely material process is capable of producing the information-rich etchings on the stone, we would be deluding ourselves. It will help archaeologists to know that they are looking at an artifact of intelligence rather than a byproduct of st strictly natural processes. This will lead them to ask other more relevant questions about the stone, such as, what do the inscriptions mean? Who wrote them? What do they tell us about the surrounding cultures at the time? And I might add, in particular, in the case of the Rosetta Stone, what languages are represented and are they telling the same story or not? Which, of course, if you don't think that they tell a story at all, if you think this is just wind and rain, those are questions you don't ask. That is to say, in this case, materialism is a science stopper. In a similar way, what we think about how animal life arose and developed, we will, uh, what we think about an how animal life arose and developed will lead us to ask different questions about living forms, questions that we might never think to ask if we were assuming that they had arisen by a purely undirected mechanism such as natural selection. The ENCODE product in an ID prediction. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the ENCODE product, and it was shown that at least 80% of the genome, uh, the human genome in particular, performs significant biological functions, dispatching, and this is a quote, dispatching the widely held view that the human genome is mostly junk DNA. As William Dembski, a leading design proponent, predicted in 1998 well before the ENCODE um, event. That's 15 years ago now. On an evolutionary view, we expect a lot of useless DNA. If, on the other hand, organisms are designed, we expect DNA as much as possible to exhibit function. The significance of these discoveries in genomics to the debate about design has passed largely unnoticed in the media but repeated attempts to stigmatize the ENCODE researchers as aiding and abetting intelligent design creationists have inadvertently highlighted what is at stake. That is to say, when people say to the researchers that, well, you're just helping the creationists. Well, maybe they are. They didn't plan to. In this effort, a biochemist at the University of Toronto, Lawrence Moran, or Larry Moran as he's commonly noted, emerged as point man. The Moran strategy centered on tarring scientists in science journals who published ENCODE and its implications with the brush of intelligent design creationism. An all too familiar conflation of intelligent design with a very different idea, the biblical literalism of young earth creationism. Although clearly not every scientist who performed research helping to establish the functional significance of non-protein coding DNA was inspired by the theory of intelligent design, at least one noteworthy scientist was. During the early part of the decade, before ENCODE made the headlines, this scientist published many articles challenging the idea of junk DNA based on genomic research that he was conducting at the National Institutes of Health. After the publication of ENCODE in 2012, his co-author on many of these articles, the prominent University of Chicago geneticist James Shapiro, who interestingly is um, calling for uh, the notation or the notion that uh, that uh, that DNA actually codes for its own guided evolution. 
acknowledged that he and his co-author had, as he put it, different evolutionary philosophies, his charitable way of referring to his co-author's growing interest in the theory of intelligent design. Who was the other scientist? None other than Richard Sternberg. That is to say, a intelligent design in some areas is not a science stopper. In fact, methodological naturalism, at least the kind that says that, that uh, there's nothing uh, having to do with intelligent design whatsoever, uh, is the actual science stopper. It expects a lot of junk DNA, so why look for a function among junk? It's just junk. Open vistas. By now it should be clear why so many brilliant scientists have missed the evidence of design in the Cambrian explosion. Scott Todd, a biologist writing in Nature, succinctly stated the reason. Even if all of the data pointed to an intelligent designer, such a hypothesis excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. As we in the intelligent design research community like to say, let's break some rules and follow the evidence wherever it leads. Now, my take on that, um, I think that methodological naturalism is a bogus uh, objection to intelligent design. You could have an intelligent design that has to do with aliens. And it would be perfectly within the realm of naturalism, of methodological naturalism, and the whole bit. What people are afraid of is the designer will turn out to be supernatural. That's really what they're afraid of. You know, you have to ask the question, are humans with minds natural? Well, if they're supernatural, then we've already got a problem, right? Because once you make the jump that human minds are supernatural, then you have no business explaining the natural world solely mm -hmm. on the basis of naturalism. Because we are, like it or not, part of the world. If you wanna, don't want to say we're part of the natural world, that's okay, but we're definitely part of the universe that we live in. The question is, could other designers be natural? Of course they could. When all the dust is settled, many scientists are afraid of where the theory of intelligent design might take them, and we're going to discuss that in a couple of weeks. <coughs> now, there's one other point, and, and this is, I think, a minor point, but it probably see, needs to be said. And it's a little uncomfortable with the story, because the four honest men watched the postman go up and down and just didn't even think about him. But once it was pointed out to them that he could have been the murderer, at least as far as I know from the story, everybody says, well, of course. The problem we have here is when the postman is pointed out, everybody says, no, no, the postman don't count. The postman can't possibly be it. And so there's a sense in which I think Steve Meyer is underestimating the, uh, uh, the force of the objection and probably also the source of the objection. <coughs> but that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Uh, we have a couple of comments here. Uh, go ahead. Uh, in defense of methodological naturalism, I'll say that if you follow methodological naturalism rigorously, you do seem to have more solid data than if you expand your uh, area of possibilities. I mean, like, if I tell you that the specific gravity of quartz is 2.65, um, that's a good solid data, you know. But if I Pardon the expression. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, you know, to a certain extent, scientists feel comfortable in this area because 
they, they've got, you know, what they see. It's matter and motion. And, uh, but uh, the, the objection I, I have to that is this is very, this is too simplistic uh, for us to be almost interested in it. If you're just going to limit your uh, ideas and your conclusions to strictly method of naturalism, uh, this is hardly interesting. There are so many factors beyond that that are interesting uh, and significant that it's really kind of naive to limit your sphere of conclusions to methodological naturalism. I'm talking about, for instance, our, our consciousness, uh, the idea that we, you know, that you go look at matter all you want to, you're not going to get an idea of consciousness there. Uh, our free will, which challenges uh, cause and effect, uh, and science. It certainly challenges certain uh, kinds of uh, naturalism and certain kinds of uh, materialism. Mm -hmm. And we can get beyond that in religion, for instance, uh, our morality. Uh, th these are things that scientists have. Uh, In fact, if scientists don't have them, there's a huge problem because then you yeah. can't trust their word. Right. And th uh, that, and that so interestingly on. enough, is becoming more of a problem in science now, or at least it's becoming perceived as more of a problem yeah. in science. I think Meyer did, did a good job here of pointing out, hey, this is a line in the sand. Reality is so much more complex. Uh, that uh, and science repeatedly does not follow methodological naturalism. That this is uh, uh, clear. Uh, but I, I would say, uh, so we get bogged down in this definition thing, and uh, uh, this is used all the time to keep creation out of the public schools by saying, hey, this is not science, this is not science. You can't have creation, it's not science, uh, type of thing. Uh, this is based on a definition of science and trying to use science as an authority while you're avoiding the basic issue and Meyer touched on it in this chapter the, uh, the real question is what is true should be interested in what is true I mean so you define science one way or define science another way I'm not interested so much in your definition of science I want to know what is true and I want to be able to look at nature and to ask what is it saying regardless of your definition of science. No comment here in this. Uh, this morning when I got up I decided to check what was going on in this room and what would be what would take place uh, over at the Centennial Building. I had to decide where I would be. I'm glad I came here. Coincidentally, the topic is the same over there right now. And the discussion will take place probably until maybe one o'clock. Now, I know what they will, <laughs> they, will, they are probably saying. I'm glad I came here because of something that you mentioned. And I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more about it. Because uh, evolutionists insist that the idea, if we allow God in the picture, that's a science stopper. Science cannot discover anything, you know, or maybe there is a limit to how far we can go in our discovery. Now, you mentioned the Rosetta Stone, and you mentioned s other things indicating or suggesting that actually the methodological naturalism could be a science stopper. Could you elaborate on that? Well, the best example I can give is one that he gave, uh, and that's ENCODE. You see... Can you explain what ENCODE is? Uh, ENCODE... Uh, is Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, I believe. Uh, if you use just the right uh, capitalization, you can get ENCODE out of that. 
Uh, that's how studies are now n normally done is so that you can refer to them by one word. And, um, but the idea was to look for uses of DNA that were not uh, simply coding for protein. Uh, and and one of the things that helped to tell you that there might be a use for DNA is if the stretch of DNA was transcribed. And it turns out that a huge percentage of DNA is transcribed. Um, that isn't the only criterion because if it were, you could run the risk of uh, simply saying, well, perhaps the transcription process is a little messy and sometimes it transcribes stuff that doesn't actually need to be transcribed because it doesn't really make protein. But it turns out that there are a lot of uh, these RNAs that are transcribed that, that bind to other RNAs that, uh, um, that actually perform noticeable functions in the cell. And so the estimate that they made was that they had found function of some kind for DNA for about 80% of the DNA. Now, this is only in certain kinds of tissue. Uh, first of all, it's adult tissue. Uh, secondly, they didn't go through the gamut of, let's say, liver, brain, um, because those are hard to biopsy in adults. Most adults don't want their, their livers punctured just because, let alone their brains biopsy, just because some scientist wants to, to find out whether there's particular kinds of DNA or RNA in, in the cells. Um, so it's not going to be a complete list. And in fact, because of certain restrictions on embryonic research, uh, embryos were not particularly looked at in, in this regard. So the 80% is probably a minimum number. That there is some kind of function that can be attributed to about 80% of the DNA and maybe more. Maybe it's more like 90, 95, maybe even 100%. Now, 100% is probably a little, a little uh, extreme because without doubt, most of us have some kinds of mutations that have made certain parts of our DNA less functional. And it's entirely conceivable that we have some parts of our DNA that are totally non-functional now that used to be functional back when we lived 900 years or whatever. Um, but it implies that the vast majority of, of DNA in our, in our system actually does something useful to the body. Now, uh, we read the Dembski quote. The Dembski quote was before all this stuff was discovered. And there was a sharp disagreement. Now, to be fair, some people exaggerated it again on the other end. That is to say, 2% of our DNA codes for proteins, maybe 3%. Um, if you look at Susanna Omo, who invented junk DNA, he said probably about 10% is going to turn out to be actually useful. Because you have to add to that 2%, you have to add binding areas for you know, uh, transcription binding areas for repressors, uh, binding areas for, the, uh, for separating chromosomes when the cell divides. And so it's probably not really 2% or 3%. Uh, I think you can quote Richard Dawkins on 3%. He was being careless. But in fact, it was something closer to, um, it was close to 10%. And in fact, that number is still being defended after ENCODE by some of these people because it made such a wonderful argument 
for there's no designer. I mean, 90% is junk. Whereas now it looks like 90% is not junk. It's basically like saying, here is a book. And 90% of it you can't even read. And then you come to find out that there are actually two languages, one of which is protein coding language and one of which is control language. And the control language covers 80%. And it doesn't look like the protein coding language, but it's actually there. And so suddenly the argument for, uh, for uh, evolution unguided falls apart. The argument for design whether evolutionary, creationary, creationist, you can't really say for sure from this data. But for some kind of design, is markedly strengthened. Well, conversely, if you're looking at it ahead of time, if you're an intelligent design advocate or even an intelligent design suspector, you go in and you look at that stuff and you say, well, maybe there's a function, maybe we should find out what it is. Whereas, you know, if it's just junk DNA, you're wasting your time. So in that particular case, intelligent design turns out to be a science facilitator and dogmatic materialism turns out to be a science stopper. Why look when you know there's nothing in there? Okay, can I interrupt? Uh, um, did the, I'm, who I'm was behind? And thank you very much. <laughs> I mean, this explanation is wonderful. Uh, who was behind the discovery that those uh, junk DNAs were not junk after all? W were, were those evolutionists or were those on the side of intelligent design? Uh, there were both kinds of people. The evolutionists generally were quite surprised by the data. The creationists, of course, or the intelligent design people, um, were not only expecting it, but were working hard to look at it, Richard Sternberg being one case in point. Um, some of the evolutionists, and one of them is Larry Moran, were vigorously against the possibility that this could be true, even after the data came out and started looking for reasons why the data wasn't really what it looked like it was. And that's why the reference to not only saying, no, no, it can't be, and I've read some of the stuff that they've said, um, and they quoted Susano Amo, and I went back to his original article and looked at it. It would be interesting to, to look at it again sometime in, in class. But uh, uh, not only did they vigorously say, no, no, this isn't true, but they were willing to try to make the people at the ENCODE look bad. In other words, the bullying that happens to intelligent design routinely happened, although fortunately to a much lesser extent, to the ENCODE people themselves. Some of whom are perfectly um, uh, conventional Darwinists. But you see, you can't approach this project from an objective point of view, because if you do, you might entertain uh, ideas that uh, are not legitimate. Um, yes. Good morning. Um, yeah, the discussion is. Uh, uh, bro broader than it has than it typically is when we talk about ID and that we're, when we try to include mental causation 
as a legitimate realm for scientific, as part of the scientific investigation. That is usually left out, and it's nice to see it included uh, because it really has to be. Uh, well, because we're here. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, so that's, you know, that broadens our thought process as well. Uh, because when we, when we talk about uh, methodological nat naturalism, we're looking at the natural world as the realm of finding truth. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, sentient beings are, are a part of that. Um, so, uh, but, but uh, the investigation is usually looked into as cause and effects. Uh, so uh, that, that we, can, we can map out in some historical uh, path. Um, the, the question still comes when we talk about mental causation, are we talking about minds that are determined, deterministic or not? Determined to be in determined, if minds are deterministic, then it, we're still within, totally within the realm that, that, that um, uh, the scientific community would be satisfied with. Um, uh, because it's determined by the, um, you know, the, uh, the world around us, our environment determines how we think and what we decide and, you know, how our genetics and from the background and that kind of thing. So, uh, uh, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's still part of the discussion. And uh, uh, we have to, to, to keep that in mind, too. And we always have to keep the demarcation between uh, um, uh, methodological naturalism and philosophical naturalism. Um, because and how science, would you make that a demarcation? It's 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 tough. Yeah, it depends on you know. Actually, it's issue. a very important question. Yeah, it is a very important question. I don't have the answer to that because I'm not a philosopher. And, well, let, uh, let me give you a, a, let me throw out an idea and, and you can bat it around a little bit then. Um, methodological naturalism is saying that at the first pass and for I don't know say the next twenty passes. We're going to be looking for, if, if we're dealing with something that's not, uh, le we'll leave human minds out of it for now. Uh, if we're dealing with a natural object, a piece of wood, a piece of uh, uh, stone, whatever, we're, we're analyzing a, a gas, let's say, that we're going to assume that it does what it does in, in, in obedience to natural law that has no reference to our own state of mind. Um, that um, if that becomes a principle that says, I don't care how many passes we take, we're not going to move on to the next stage. I think at that point you have moved from methodological naturalism to philosophical naturalism when you will not let anything other than methodological naturalism work, regardless of how obvious the evidence, regardless of how, uh, then I think you've moved from methodological naturalism to philosophical naturalism. And at that point, methodological naturalism becomes actually a smokescreen. Well, I, I think it depends. There's a level of presuppositions that you're, you're taking. If you, uh, when methodological naturalism, you would be taking the presupposition that the scientific method is valid. Uh, in philosophical naturalism, you would be questioning what do we really mean by the scientific method. So, uh, you know, it, so there's, it, it's a level of presuppositions that you're, you're, you're basing your, your, uh, you know, your path forward on. Well, if you assume, no matter what the evidence, that methodological naturalism is going to give you the correct answer, then I don't see how you cannot call that philosophical naturalism. Well, it you know, in, in all approaches, we always have presuppositions where we're starting from. There's different layers. But see, there are some presuppositions that are, as the lawyers would call them, rebuttable. That is to say, we're going to assume for now that this is true, but, you know, if it turns out that there's strong evidence to otherwise, then, then we'll just change. Um, such things might be, you know, all swans are white. You see one black swan, you say, oh, well, you know, I guess we uh, were wrong in that assumption. 
Well, I, I think if you get to Australia, then you find out that there are whole herds of, or whatever the term is proper for, uh, of swans that are black. Well, I, I think even Popper has said that that's a, that would be a metaphysical statement, not a, not a scientific statement. Well, it can be a scientific statement if it is held conditionally. But once you move beyond holding it conditionally, you see, once you get past, well, we can explain everything so far, and we'll probably can explain it in the future, but who knows, something else might turn up. You're then methodologically natural. If you go beyond that and say, no, you know, not only can we explain things so far, but in fact, every instance will turn out regardless as somehow being natural. You've moved into philosophical naturalism. That's what philosophical naturalism means. It doesn't mean that I can explain everything. What it means is that I will only allow naturalistic explanations. And when you, when you make that, when you make methodological naturalism into a dogma, then you're not methodologically. You have now added philosophical to it. Well, that, that's, yeah, that, that's true. And, uh, 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 now, the, the, one of the reasons that people do that is because they don't want God interfering with certain things, okay? And in fact, it's very interesting because the famous quote that Luantin gave ends with, out to, after the divine foot in the door, anybody who believes in God will believe in anything. As if God is somehow completely disorganized. I mean, it's true that God could break through, but 99.99 something percent, he doesn't. It's only on very special occasions that he does. And most of us operate on, uh, on methodological naturalism. I know as a physician, most of the time I do. People come in and they give me symptoms and they try to figure out what kind of cause it is, and I'm usually looking for a naturalistic cause. I'm not usually, although occasionally you look for a psychological cause too, because and is, is that natural or not? Well, it depends on how, what you believe about psychological causes, I guess. But, um, but we learn all kinds of things because we believe that most, most of the time, uh, the way the world works, it works on a relatively, you know, a predictable and in some senses me mechanistic uh, uh, way. Now, in fact, we know that that's not true. Uh, Einstein Bose uh, condensates are able to stack millions, and this is literal, of atoms into one in the same space. Now you figure out how that is done mechanistically. Mathematically, it makes a lot of sense. And if you're looking at quantum mechanics, it makes a lot of sense. That's why they tried the experiment in the first place, is because Bose and Einstein jointly wrote a paper that said you should be able to find this if things get cold enough. The waveforms overlap. They occupy the same space. And you're going, how do you do that? Well, the fact of the matter is that we don't know any more of how they do that than people of Newton's day knew how gravity could pull on the moon without an intervening chain or something. Yeah, superposition is of uh, waves, uh, you know, are, are, are reasonable, so. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 it's certainly a possibility. Um, but we, you know, in, in what you're talking about in terms of your applications, that's more of an applied science than, than a fundamental science. Well, yeah. But it's based on fundamental science. Abs absolutely, but uh, we're, we, that's where, you know, we're, we're applying things 
uh, in the real world that we don't have to turn to God to, yeah. to expect to, to put his finger in there somewhere. But I'm going to make a case that if God is really the kind of person that wants us to know stuff, that I think that on occasion he makes it easier for us, that God actually helps science rather than hinders it. And the best example I can give you is Gregor Mendel's Peas, which if you go back to the old experiments and how they were recorded, it turns out that the data are too good. That is to say, the one-fourth, three-fourths, the statistical variance between them is not what you would expect from uh, just statistics purely alone. And I would make a case that if God intervened in the laboratory, he might actually make it easy for us, not harder for us, because God believes in science. Well, we're, we're, we're looking for, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you're looking for secondary causes rather than primary, and, and uh, that's a harder thing to do. And I've, I've talked enough time here. I'm sure somebody else has some comments. Well, I... I guess if nobody has any more questions, next week we'll do the last of the, um, of the book and then uh, uh, within the, the next few times. And there's one other thing I'm going to do as well, and that is I'm going to take up some of the negative reviews of the book. Um, in other words, uh, you know, what do people criticize from the book to give you an idea of you know, the weight of the criticisms that can be leveled, or at least that have been leveled and maybe give an idea of the, the weight of the criticisms that can be leveled. Because uh, I think that's an important exercise when you've done, uh, when you've looked at something this, this, this big. See you next week.